giving a cheer to a female founder. And we have Julie amongst us. You know, get up and wave. Um, runs a company called Champion. You should look it up. She's phenomenal. So um, we have a phenomenal panel today. And for everybody who's attended the other panels, this is the most meta of them all. So uh, if you didn't really come into the mood uh, to think, uh, this may be the time to escape. Because uh, this, this, will, this is about to get deep. Um, it's my honor and pleasure to actually be amongst this company because we saved the best for the last. And these are two geniuses I've been meaning to actually get to talk to. So Kim, a uh, legend in the field, everybody knows her, uh, has had a phenomenal career uh, in, in, in media. Uh, originally coming from Condé Nast in a variety of places, an avid investor, and now the chief commercial officer at AMC. And Roberto, who, whose career is as vast as, uh, as my interests. So started off as an IP lawyer, uh, uh, quits when he becomes a partner, only to start a couple agencies, sells out of them, to then start a growth uh, agency, to then now starting a Web3 agency. So he's done a variety of things, and sprinkled in the middle are 50 plus investments in a variety of areas. So. Um, uh, I'm, I'm truly honored to be in this company, and we'll ask some tough questions today. And to set the context, here's the deal, right? Uh, apparently, the Big Bang happened 14 billion years ago. And uh, apparently, there are 10 to the power of 36 planets in the universe. Uh, apparently, we live in a galaxy that's kind of medium to small level galaxy. Apparently, our solar system is a medium to small level solar system, and our planet is a medium to small level planet. It's a spinning rock in the middle of the universe that happens to have life that started about four billion years ago. Within that, human life came about five million years ago. Within that, civilization, probably 4,000 years ago. And during this process, as we developed consciousness, the only way we figured out on how to survive and move large masses of people, which is how we conquered the planet, was by telling ourselves stories. Stories were originally around Eastern thinking versus Western thinking, to uh, stories around religion. You know, you have the Hindus, you have the Buddhists, you have the Jews, you have the Muslims, you have the Christians. Within every little religion, there were subsects. You have the Shias and the Sunnis. You have the caste system. Each one was told a different story. Then came the idea of nation states, where like this is America, and this is what we stand for, and everybody in this land who abides by this will believe in this. This is what will give us identity. So it's important to understand what defines us and what de defines our culture and behavior are myths, stories, songs, and rituals. The human brain is a pattern-seeking storytelling device. We tell stories to live. We tell stories to be able to make sense to other people. And that's all the time around us. So I will start with a story that influenced my life. When I was growing up in India, born in the year 1985, most of the women represented in Bollywood movies were righteous women. Uh, they, they were you know, uh, sacrificing. Uh, they didn't work. They did everything for their families. And there was a tiny sliver of cinema, art cinema, where women smoked, drank, worked, and were like the women you want to see it represented. My mom was one of those women. She drank, she worked, which was a rarity in the society that we lived in. Fast forward 30 years, the one credit Indians do get is that they love their education. And now with this vast population of women being educated and entering the workforce, they get commercial power. And they get the right to, to ask for, for representation. And content started being created to, to have that representation. So much so, they had so much buying power that now this is what's deciding the commercial decisions. So in this remarkable nexus of content, culture, and commerce sits our discussion today. 
So my first question is, you know, you've, you've had to navigate this remarkable fine line between these three things throughout the course of your career. How have you dealt with it? How do you make decisions? How do you do it? Well, it's good to be here. And he wasn't kidding about the hard questions. No, I would say listening to you, I think about the storytelling aspect of what you just said. And that has been the most influential in decision making on, on where I go and then how long I stay and, and how successful that stint is. Um, I love working with storytellers. I wish I was a better storyteller. You're, you're quite good. Um, I, I think that when I think about kind of those pivotal moments in my career, I spent almost 18 years in publishing, magazine publishing specifically. And it's interesting, I think about after, after 30 years in media, I think about the, the pebbles in the pond analogy and what are the pebbles that potentially um, led to the ripples that ultimately led to wherever things ha are now. And the story I'd probably reference is in, in early days of, or not even that early days, 30 years ago when I started in magazines, um, magazines were actually about real people and they told real stories. And then to sell more magazines, it started to morph a lot. And Photoshopping got really good. And magazines started to tell and represent things that weren't real. And um, in particular, women's magazines, regretfully. And I think that I think that those early decisions made then, which were very commercial in nature, they were about advertising, they were about money, um, ultimately helped lead to the demise of, of magazines in their kind of it, uh, representative way in the larger media landscape. So that's the story I think of, and I, I think that you can almost point to, and of course there's a million things that happen. We all work in media or media related. There's a million things that can happen, but I always, I think back to all those pebbles in the pond, and that's the one that jumped out at me when you yeah. asked me that question. Remarkable, Roberto. Uh, decisioning, um, somewhat informed by one of my, I mean, my favorite thought leader in our space, you. Uh, Pranav is often quoted with the uh, sort of framework that describes the human brain as hardware, stop me if I butcher this, <laughs> culture as the software. And, you know, I grew up as an intellectual property lawyer, always put the technology first before very quickly learning that it's only as good as the utility it affords. So um, that has sort of framed the uh, approach in terms of optimizing for when we say culture, we're really talking about, I guess, these subcultures, but op optimizing for the utility to the consumer. In about 2012, I had the opportunity to work with the team taking Cristiano Ronaldo onto Facebook. And um, I had no right to be doing this, by the way. It was just a wrong place, right time situation. Um, it went on to become uh, what is today still, I think, one of the largest pages in the world, uh, but it didn't start that way. We launched um, with you know, spewing all of the highly polished Nike and Real Madrid material. And yes, engagement was good, but it really hockey sticked when um, Cristiano insisted we post a photo of his dinner. And he wasn't even in the photo. And that was the moment that our engagement hockey stick, because the utility that was being afforded in this uh, you know, discrete instance of social media was vastly different from all of the other content that was readily locatable uh, uh, across the internet. So there was, uh, that was a very early instance in learning to optimize for consumer utility or culture. Remarkable. So, at NeuroInsight, we have this model. And actually, Samrat, raise your hand. He, he is to be credited to have come up with the, with the model. And the model is like this. It's called IPDR. Essentially saying, I stands for innovation, P stands for popularity, D for dependence, and R for resurgence. Essentially saying that every part of culture, whether it is a celebrity, whether it's an idea, whether it's a brand, 
follows this little pattern. You start off as the fringe. It's something new. It's innovative. It has a small but dedicated audience. But it's small. It's commercially successful-ish, but not a blockbuster. And then you take this idea and it becomes mass market. It becomes popular. And that's when you really, really bring in the big bucks. It's, it's pe people know it, people want it, people desire it. It's cool to have it. Then after a while, you get into dependence. Dependence is where you know what it is and you go to this thing for your needs. Within that, you get into this thing called caustic dependence, where you know exactly what it is and you don't want it. And if you're lucky, you get to the resurgence stage, where a, a different set of people finds this idea, they're like, hey, that's cool. That Marshall speaker is actually pretty cool. Um, so that's how everything in society works. And most people, as we're seeing today with you know, the digitization of every single network, People love to live in the, the popular and dependable categories because that's where the most money is. But actually, the true definers of culture and the true gainers of commercial success from this are the people who take things from innovative into popularity and people who drag things out of caustic dependability into resurgence. So again, in your careers, you must have seen so many instances of these things happening. Share a couple examples with us on where you saw it, you participated, or you may have gotten it wrong. Oh boy, I have a long list of where I've gotten it wrong. But um, I and, and I wish I could I could take credit for any that jumped to mind, but I, I can't. But I was in the organizations when they did. Um, I actually, I think where I am now, most most recently, AMC branded itself in the content world based on shows that everyone else passed on. So they saw opportunity in things like The Walking Dead that HBO and Showtime said, absolutely not, there's no appetite for that. Or for Mad Men that those same two companies passed on. And they, you know, my predecessor and people at the company before I got there, they saw something and said, oh no, there's, there's something here. It may be small, but we can make this great. In particular, I would call out The Walking Dead um, which is pretty representative of where we all are now, but the, the reality of, of actually wanting to introduce an, a show that's really about people. Everyone who hasn't watched it says it's about zombies, but it's really about people fighting things that are impossible to fight. Politicians, wars, nature, you know, human nature. And when everything is out of control, what matters? Well, everything you do. And, and actually the show garnered the largest audience on television that there's ever been. And uh, it's one everyone still aspires to, to grab. And, and truly what was a small idea ended up being the biggest show on television. And it's been running for 11 years. And it's, it's, I, I find it awesome. And I think it's exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, what a great example. Roberto. Um, the Pranav and I have known each other for quite a while. He encouraged me to tell everyone of all the times I effed up. Uh, one of them is actually a good uh, example here. Um, I, my first failed startup uh, started in about 2005. Uh, we saw the birth of YouTube, and I believed that one day people would watch um, TV quality content on the internet. Um, that was a really hard company to raise for. No one believed me. Um, and to some extent, they were right in doing so. Um, 18 months later and about a year before the launch of Hulu, th that company had shuttered. Uh, and it wasn't lacking in its uh, perspective on what the technology could do. I had been blind to the context in, in which I had tried to apply it. This was uh, a world where there wasn't a solution, there wasn't a problem for my solution. People were more than happy with their television viewing habits. They were still somewhat afraid to put credit cards on the internet and digital impressions didn't pay. Um, so that it, was the it took a global learning. pandemic for 30% of these people to get on. So it, I was, yeah, <laughs> 20 years too soon. Um, 
Um, but look, that experience then informed uh, many of the sort of fruitful or more successful things that, that followed. It was um, uh, an opportunity to revisit everything through the primary aperture of the consumer or cultural context. Uh, and that sort of led to, you know, early entry as be, be it as an investor or a strategic advisor into esports, live streaming, social commerce, blockchain. Uh, and I guess, I guess the sort of overarching takeaway was I learned to be far more curious uh, and force myself out of my comfort zone. It's the reason you'll find me at Burning Man. It's the reason I'm the oldest person at Coachella every year um, and have the misfortune of being on Discord as well. So <laughs> I, I encourage everyone to do the same. <laughs> Can I add to that really quick? Please. Because, oh my God, I have the most spectacular failure. I um, <laughs> I uh, I took a right turn for a while, and I went to a startup, a fabulous company, um, again ahead of its time, venture backed. So we had them breathing down our necks all the time on getting their money back. But under that, the idea was attention, and I know you just spoke about attention. But it was about 15 years ago, and the whole company's premise was built around the importance of intention, especially when it came to advertising. And uh, it was absolutely the right idea and absolutely the wrong time. And I, it's so interesting for all those in, in this group that, that have a great idea. It, you know, I do it all over again. I think like most of us with our mistakes, you, you knock around long enough, it, it makes you stronger as a person, it makes you stronger as a business executive. But I feel like you take those learnings and, and you're that much better. You have that much more to bring to the conversation and the table. So, I, I, But I do think the timing, the timing thing is the one piece you can't control in your scenario. I mean, think about me, guys. I started a brain mapping company <laughs> for an Says industry. no one. Yeah. Like, <laughs> Like in an, in, an, in an industry uh, that is obsessed with surveys. And when I tell them I study the subconscious, the, the, the best possible response I get is, do you track eyes? Because this is the limitation of their, their imagination. Um, but, you know, and, and there have been times where I have felt that uh, maybe, maybe I shouldn't do this. But the question always is that, is this, does this have the ability to bring about change? Uh, and do I believe in it? And if I believe in it, uh, I will keep working for it. Uh, so I'm glad that, you know, you've, you've had that experience too. And that, you know, in a way, in a way you, when you're taking something from innovative to popularity, you, there's the thing, but you have to create the audience with it as well. And I think my 12 years in doing this have, have essentially created uh, at least some fraction of an audience in, in it for it. So, which leads us to the next question, which is a little more fun. This beautiful mixture of commerce and content and culture, when people get it right, you know, it just blows up because you know, as I heard from my friend, philosopher guy, John Zweig, there is this mystery embedded in our nervous system that refuses to cooperate with logical consistency. And in a world where we are blasted with content and messages every day, it seems it's almost impossible to cut through, yet there are things that stand out and that there are those are the things that have that magical combination of culture, commerce, um, and content. In, in, in the previous few years, we've seen brands like Dove, you know, a soap company. They have no right to talk about, you know, again, female beauty in general, but they own that conversation and how delightfully the world responded. Then you have, you know, places like Netflix invest $250 million in a movie like Red Notice with, you know, and I do love Ryan Reynolds, and I think Gal Gadot is amazing too. And The Rock's fine. Um, but they, they took popular people and they put in fantastic action sequences, but it just did not resonate. It had all the ingredients, but did not cut through. So what are the examples of this magical mix of things, or lack thereof, that you've seen in the industry? Could be shows or advertising or anything. Oh. 
I feel like there's so many examples of of really incredible content right now in this golden age of content that that everyone has an opportunity to look forward to stumbling upon because it is very hard to cut through right now and actually you can make something you can spend a lot of money making something and if you can't get it marketed and if you can't get it talked about or even get that seed planted um, it Actually, I actually think it goes into the strength of the library. We have shows that are discovered often, things that were moderate hits that what I love about the way people watch now is, you know, this is a true story. My 16 year old walked into the living room the other day. My husband and I are sitting there and he was like, oh my God, I'm watching the best show. Have you ever seen Seinfeld? <laughs> <laughs> like, like, he and, like he has now found this show and, and you know, unapologetically we were like, oh uh, yeah. Um, but it's, I, I feel like, but how great is that? And, and that's an example resurgence. of resurgence, <laughs> exactly. But I would say the one thing I've grown a wildly healthy um, respect for is when the, is what I would call fandom. And actually it is called fandom. And I'll use The Walking Dead as, as a perfect example. When you, when you get that large, um, if you are truly responsive to the people that are responding to you and you give them more and more and more, they, they want a piece of that. It's self-defining. It's how, what I love about being in media and entertainment is, you know, the one common denominator in a group of people who don't know each other is to start talking about what they identify with. What do they watch? What do they, what do they care about? Who, who are their people? And, and that's, that's where, you know, when we get into Web3, when we've gotten into, uh, gotten into the kind of next frontier spaces, that's the show you go with. Yeah. Because the fandom is there and they're waiting for us. And actually they're kind of saying, why is it taking you so long to meet me where I am? So right. I, we see it all the time. Roberta? Kim took the over, I'll take the under. Okay. <laughs> Walking Dead is actually a great example because they've cultivated this giant uh, fandom uh, with a television series, but it came from a comic book with a pre-existing fandom, uh, a fandom that most likely informed the choice to pick it up in the first place because pre-existing fandoms solve for discoverability in this sort of uh, you know, new ecosystem of trying to find a show. Uh, I look at an equivalent with Ghost in the Shell. So I am a, uh, an you know, unapologetic manga and anime uh, and actually Japanese video game fan. Um, Ghost in the Shell had always been one of my beloved uh, titles, be it in its manga or anime iterations. Um, in a similar fashion, Hollywood saw this large pre-existing fandom as an opportunity to uh, adapt into a feature film. Uh, but along the way, in an effort to reach the broadest possible audience and justify its $200 million budget, neither served the existing fandom that they sought to port over, nor um, were able to find uh, a net new one. Some may blame the fact that um, our female Japanese major was Scarlett Johansson, uh, <laughs> but there were other sort of um, dilutions along the way that didn't recognize the, the sort of kernel uh, of, of, of the fandom or the, back to our three C's, the um, culture, context, community, and consumer uh, that lived uh, underneath it. Remarkable. All right. This is rather broad and meta because we're about to end. It's also slightly depressing, but stay with us. <laughs> We've, we've established that culture is built on myths, stories, songs, and rituals, right? Look at where our stories have brought us. It's 2022, every 2022, yeah. And we're still fighting for gender equality. We are still fighting for racial equality. We have the highest rate of anxiety, panic attacks. The second largest cause, cause of adult death in America is by suicide. Um, that's the reality. And, and our stories have brought us here, which is fine. This is where we're at. But that's the depressing part. But as we build the future uh, through either 
Web 2.5, if not 3 yet, and through the content that we produce. How should we think about it? What should we be solving for as we create the myths, the stories, the songs and rituals for the future so that we can invest in the long-term human project that we happen to be a part of so our minuscule history on this planet that we discussed in the beginning is extended further than the next couple generations. Um, so how do we take into account the future that we want to build? So over to you. Look, I'm going to quote my second favorite thought leader in our space, uh, George Washington. <laughs> he, very early on, and this is in the context of uh, the sort of where this is going, um, he very early on said that uh, freedom and property rights are inseparable. You can't have one without the other. And so when we start to think about that in the context of, as Pranav said, Web 2.5 where we have Web 2 apertures giving us access to elements of Web 3, blockchain-enabled assets, experiences, etc. And what do they unlock? They are unlocking true digital asset ownership by consumers, or, quoting George, arguably true freedom. And so a lot of the elements, Pranav, when we talk about designing the future, with our brand hat on, there needs to be an understanding that this, there's a fundamental shift going on as uh, we move from audience to community and uh, customer to stakeholder. Again, all born from arguably data sovereignty, but more importantly, um, true digital asset ownership. So a lot of the things that, you know, when we talk about representation, some of the other elements will be forced upon us by the uh, digital asset owning community and soon to be stakeholder in our brands. So brands will need to be, I believe, early entrance into the space to understand the culture, appreciate what the consumer is demanding, and then more importantly, as a bigger question, work out what business or brand equity they're prepared to hand over to their consumers, because uh, it, that will be the table stakes. Fantastic. It's very hard to follow. Are you hard to follow? Fine. We won't follow it. So we have a minute left. Does anybody have a question? You sprung that on them. Yeah. <laughs> well, we'll, we'll, we'll conclude. You have a question, Samrat? All right, go for it. No, just yell. Uh, amazing panel. A uh, quick question for you guys. As you were talking about The Walking Dead, story goes that it was being pitched for as a long form, mm -hmm. multi-season, and the network said, no, don't want to do it. Do it something short. Yeah. But you guys saw the reality of it. You were talking about Ghost in the Shell and agree with you, complete bastardization and destruction. But there was one show that came out in the 60s, was rebooted in the 90s, and then continued, which was one of the first shows that spoke of hope, a new, new reality for humanity. And for those of you who don't know, I'm talking about Star Trek The Next Generation and Star Trek The jo Roddenberry series. We don't see shows like that anymore. Is that because there's no commerce in that? Or does culture not have appetite for it? Oh, that's such a great question. I'll take a stab. I would say that you might, the commercial piece that you've been referencing, that the expectation of how fast that needs to appear has, has gotten so short that it, it doesn't give a lot of these shows the breathing room to become what they really are going to be. We actually just made a huge commitment to Anne Rice and to telling her stories, and we just debuted with an interview with the vampire and it's it's a beautiful incredible show and then it rolls into mayfair witches and and it, it it's we're we're very committed it is a decade commitment very few entertainment companies have the the wherewithal because we've had some success we're we're willing to take on that risk but it is risk because because revenue is expected to follow so quickly now. It's putting undue pressure, I think, on, on the story, on the true story that you're talking about. They're still there, 
we just it just has to catch fire very fast fantastic well join me in thanking our panelists thank you this is lovely thank you, thank you.